Hello folks, this is part one of our lecture now on women and the civil rights movement. 1955 to 1965, and here we continue our discussion now of America in the post-World War II era, uh, and in particular, take a special look at what was in effect, a kind of revolution, a social and political and cultural revolution going on in America after World War II in the area of civil rights. You'll recall that it was first after the Civil War when the emancipation uh, of enslaved Americans led to uh, Congress's effort to create civil rights for those who were deemed freedmen, that is the freed men and women who formerly had been slaves and who now as free people were uh, seeking to claim the same fundamental legal and political rights and liberties as other Americans. And that period of reconstruction, as we've seen, ended on a rather ambivalent note with certain liberties having been established, but also with the rise of Jim Crow, uh, those liberties also directly challenged by white supremacy. So here we have what sometimes historians call a second reconstruction in the post-war period, which is now a renewed effort coming out of World War II to uh, make America own up to its promise of liberty and justice for all. And uh, make no mistake that World War II was a catalyst, not only for civil rights in America, but, but globally as well. And how could it not have been the scenes of liberation, for example, as the Americans marched down the Champs-Élysées of Paris in 1944, uh, liberating uh, Paris and eventually all of France from Nazi rule uh, from Hitler's uh, wartime aggression now comes liberation with the defeat of the Nazis and their allies in Europe and ultimately with the Japanese in the Pacific. And these stirring scenes of liberation inspire a wave of revolution reform and a call to action that we sometimes refer to is decolonization. Uh, remember that the European powers of the day still at the time of World War II held on to their imperial claims of colonialization globally. Uh, that is to say around the world, in Asia, in Africa, South America, and elsewhere, the claims of Western powers to uh, rule over and govern uh, foreign peoples typically on what was a kind of uh, argument for racial supremacy or the white man's burden as it was sometimes known. Well, that age of European racially inspired imperialism uh, will largely come to an end as a result of World War II as uh, peoples uh, formerly under colonial rule will now begin to assert their own rights in this age of liberation. And uh, no right was more important than that of self-government. Here you see a picture of the great Vietnamese revolutionary leaders, including Ho Chi Minh uh, on the right, who will proclaim Vietnam's independence from French colonization. But this happens uh, worldwide in, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in India, and elsewhere. Along with calls for decolonization, a wave of social democracy sweeps across Europe and the United States. We saw in America during the Great Depression Roosevelt's New Deal, which offered a kind of safety net of relief and reform for working Americans. Well, that basic promise uh, is also now part of political movements uh, in Europe as well. In England, you see here a picture showing the uh, the beginnings of what becomes the British national health care system, which will entitle all English subjects to uh, 
uh, government subsidized essentially free health care. So the idea that government also owed its citizens, particularly its working people, its poor, basic guarantees of social welfare uh, in support of the greater good of economic health and vital uh, social health. And this, this inspiration now will also play uh, into the call for civil rights in the United States. One other example coming out of World War II that will inspire the civil rights movement here in the United States uh, is what happens on a global level with the United Nations, the foundation of the United Nations as a transnational global organization representing all the sovereign nations of the world uh, and uh, instituting from uh, the earliest years of its, exi its existence uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, a uh, uh, charter statement of purpose for the United Nations to recognize the basic rights of all human beings. And against this backdrop photo here showing uh, Jews in Europe being herded onto uh, train cars uh, destined for uh, killing um, camps, uh, death camps so-called, and concentration camps in some cases, or labor, so often slave labor camps, what we know as the Holocaust, will also help inspire the UN Declaration of Human Rights. One of whose uh, chief signatories, by the way, was Eleanor Roosevelt, who was appointed by President Truman uh, to the committee that would represent the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And those uh, words uh, which rang out from the, the statement in 48 made it clear, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. So a, an inspiring statement by the newly formed United Nations on behalf of the basic concepts of human rights. And there's a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the chief signatories, that is uh, one of the committee members who was responsible for uh, putting together this uh, this dramatic statement. As you probably know, no sooner had World War II ended than what historians called the Cold War uh, began. And this was partly uh, the result of decolonization. That is, for the first time, uh, states that had been under colonial rule would become independent uh, and thus politically non-aligned with the great powers uh, at that time, primarily the United States uh, and the Soviet Union, America's wartime ally, ally but now post-war rival, the Soviet Union. And it was, of course, uh, the basis of what became the Cold War, this conflict between America and the Soviet Union, uh, between uh, the competing ideologies of capitalism and communism that will see uh, these newly freed former colonial states now uh, becoming pawns in the great global chess match between capitalism and communism waged by the United States and the Soviet Union known as the Cold War. Uh, and these so-called third world nations represent peoples who mostly are left out of the affluence and prosperity created by the Industrial Revolution in Europe and the United States uh, and thus are seen as, once again, uh, people who are really up for grabs in Africa, in Asia and elsewhere, people who are up for grabs by the world's uh, <clears throat> major powers, America and her allies on the one side and the Soviet Union and her growing uh, collection of communist allies. And what this does in America is puts a great deal of pressure politically uh, on our leaders to define the United States now 
as the defender of the free world. Uh, that is uh, the uh, primary influence that could confront and stall the spread of communism on behalf of capitalism and democracy, and in particular those non-aligned former colonial nations in Africa and Asia uh, where the threat of communist expansion was ever present uh, that American policy leaders and political statesmen are proclaiming it to be America's primary duty to support the cause of human rights and freedom and democracy for these people who, take note, were by and large non-white, often non-Christian, African and Asian people. Well, you might get a sense of, of where we're going with this, because if America was going to stand for the human rights globally of non-white people, the question here in the United States would be, would our country stand for the rights of non-white citizens in America? Remember, apartheid had not been only a tradition in America, that is, a kind of informal tradition growing out of slavery. And when I say apartheid, of course, I mean racial segregation or Jim Crow. But it had been cloaked with constitutional authority by the Supreme Court. In the 1896 Supreme Court case famously known as Plessy v. Ferguson, the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled that a statute which implies merely a legal distinction between the white and colored races meaning a segregation law, a distinction which is founded in the color of two races has no tendency to destroy the legal equality of the two races. So here was the U.S. Supreme Court ruling segregation, racial segregation, that is the dividing of people in all areas of public life according to color, that that had no tendency to destroy legal equality. It was, as the famous phrase implies, simply separate but equal. So with the Supreme Court's blessing, racial segregation, what in South Africa was called apartheid, would now become the law of the land and for the next several decades reign supreme as the fundamental legal principle regarding the relations of people of different color in the United States. And of course, Jim Crow, as it was known, was nearly universal. Uh, not only in the South, but really nationwide. Wherever there might be waiting rooms, there could be segregation. Wherever people might go for recreation, there could be segregation. Wherever a family might wish to visit uh, on a weekend afternoon, there could be segregation. And note here, before you uh, conclude that this was uh, some example of reverse discrimination issued by the Memphis Park Commission, the fact that no white people were allowed in the zoo on that day only meant that Jim Crow reserved a tiny fraction of the available days for the public to visit the Memphis Zoo. And when they did, they had to be their exclusive and segregated. Something as simple as getting a drink of water on a hot day, of course, famously became segregated. American apartheid reached right in to the most mundane daily labors, like doing your laundry, or in the case of the Imperial Laundry Company, having it done for you. America's apartheid extended to other groups as well. It was not purely a black-white issue, but a white and non-white issue more broadly, as others, including uh, immigrants from south of the border, uh, from Mexico or other Latin American countries, uh, might also be segregated, just as immigrants from Asia had uh, in the 1920s, actually going all the way back to the 1880s, uh, it seems that segregation had a long tradition uh, 
in America, as Native American people were placed on segregated reservations, Asian people were segregated even before Pearl Harbor. The Japanese, for example, in California uh, experienced various kinds of segregation. And so the, intern the internment camps in World War II, a kind of continuation of segregation policy. And for Spanish-speaking, often darker-skinned, um, uh, Latino or Latina uh, peoples, uh, that is, uh, those who had come to America to work, uh, had migrated to this country uh, from Latin America, they too subject uh, to America's tradition of segregation. So uh, that's the basic context. Now, civil rights, as we've seen, had become an issue during the war. Uh, this was a people's war for freedom, proclaimed uh, Franklin Roosevelt, a fight for America's four freedoms, he famously proclaimed. And yet, uh, as a fundamentally segregated country, it was not lost on America's racial and ethnic minorities that they were still being regarded as second-class citizens in this fight for freedom. Famously, it was Army 2nd Lieutenant John Roosevelt Robinson uh, a lieutenant in the U.S. Army who was court-martialed for refusing to sit in the back of a segregated Army bus while in uniform on a military base, Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, you might remember Lieutenant Robinson better for his post-war career as the man who broke the Major League color line, Jackie Robinson, World War II veteran who first fought segregation as a soldier in the U.S. Army and would continue uh, in the effort to desegregate the major leagues. For women of color uh, as well who served in the armed forces during the war, here you see uh, Army Auxiliaries Ruth Wade and Lucille Mayo who were working as mechanics servicing military trucks uh, during their uh, term of service in World War II. Uh, as did other women of color work uh, in the defense industries during the war as riveters and welders. Uh, Josie the Riveter was the black woman's counterpart to Rosie the Riveter, uh, the famous white symbol. Uh, so as welders, Alvia Scott, Hattie Carpenter, and Flossie Burtis, who you see here, welding a piece of steel in one of California's Kaiser shipyards during World War II. Now note, whether in the military service, uh, such as Ruth Wade and, and Lucille Mayo, or here as workers in the defense industry, uh, black women as black men worked in segregated units and in segregated uh, worker shifts. After the war, civil rights organizations mobilized to carry on the fight for racial justice that had begun during World War II. Famously, this culminates in a landmark civil rights court decision, uh, the so-called Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954, which saw the NAACP lead a successful fight against segregation in the public schools of America, centering on a school district in Topeka, Kansas, where young Karen Brown was forced to travel outside her local neighborhood where her family lived to attend an all-black segregated school on the other side of Topeka. Uh, her lawyers, NAACP lawyers, argued this provided or presented not only a great hardship on the family economically, but, uh, but also stigmatize them in their own neighborhood as somehow lesser or uh, inadequate to the uh, right of attending the local school. And so it was the overturning of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1954 by uh, the Supreme Court. Rarely does the court reverse itself so dramatically, reverse its own precedent. But in 1954, that's exactly what happened as a great victory now for the civil rights, legal civil rights movement uh, was gained. And thus schools would become 
thereafter quickly a battleground as whites in particularly in southern states so they're not exclusively in southern states will take offense at what they see as the overturning of their traditions of segregation by the federal government by the federal court system in particular and refuse the court's order to integrate their schools and when the federal government under president eisenhower pushed the issue a few years later in little rock arkansas in 1957 uh, using the president's power as commander-in-chief to mobilize the arkansas state guard on behalf of a small group of black students who wish to enroll in Little Rock's Central High School in conformity with the Supreme Court ruling and were met with great resistance. As you can see in this famous picture, uh, locals, men and women, young and old, white protesters, defenders of segregation, defenders of racial supremacy now um, harassing uh, and uh, demeaning the efforts of these uh, black students to take their place rightfully uh, as the law now insisted they must be allowed to do so uh, an important legal victory yes but as we can see from the little rock central high school example uh, the question was where did the law reside in in the land of jim crow in other words was it sufficient for a court especially a federal court to issue a ruling if the people living in those areas directly affected uh say in in this case in in arkansas in little rock uh, if the white majority of little rock was unwilling to cooperate uh with the, the the legal decree of integration then what was it going to take to turn the promise of civil rights and even the legal promise of civil rights into an established fact uh, and the answer to that we will see in part two of this lecture was essentially a popular movement taking to the streets as it were on behalf of civil rights to force the issue of legal equality uh, an issue of, uh, which after all had been promised uh, after the civil war for example uh, in the uh, reconstruction laws and the reconstruction amendments but which had been left null and void over the decades but now would be the time uh, in which that promise would be fully put to the test. So we'll come back in part two of this civil rights lecture to see how that popular movement for civil rights is going to play out.